friends welcome to today's session in today's class i have planned to discuss one of the commonest chromosomal anomalies seen in pediatrics that is down syndrome so let's begin at the end of today's session you will be able to discuss the genetic basis risk factors complications prenatal diagnosis management genetic counseling in down syndrome identify the clinical features of down syndrome interpret what is a normal carrier type and hence recognize in trisomy 21 as well as discuss the multidisciplinary approach to the management of down syndrome so how have i outlined this session we will be beginning with the clinical case scenario proceeding to the introduction of down syndrome the etiopathogenesis of down syndrome the clinical features of down syndrome complications investigations management finally i'll be concluding with my summary and take home message and the test time so the clinical case scenario a one and a half year old child is brought to the opd with delayed achievements of developmental milestones he is able to walk with support but unable to walk independently he says only monosyllable and plays with his sibling he has just attained a pincer grasp this is a child who is one and a half year old detailed history revealed that at his birth his mother's age was 40 years She had had an uneventful antenatal history. The baby was born at term, cried at birth, and had a normal postnatal period. On examination, what did we find? Vitals were stable. Anthropometry showed a weight of twelve kgs and a length of seventy-seven centimeters. Head circumference was thirty-eight centimeters. On head to toe examination, these following findings were evident. There was a mongoloid slant of the eyes. Hypertelorism with was present with epicanthic folds. Simian crease was present in both the palms. Sandal gap was noted in both feet, and the child had a short fifth digit in the hand with clinodactyly. In systemic examination, the central nervous system showed a developmental age of nine months. There was generalized hypotonia with reflexes being just elicitable, and plantars were flexor bilaterally. In cardiovascular system, S1 S2 was heard. There was also a pan-systolic murmur heard. Respiratory system, GIT system were normal. Musculoskeletal system showed hypermobility of the joints. So with this, we have had lots of positive features in this child. We have a child who has had delayed developmental milestones to start with. His mother is an elderly, primary gravida mother. The child has been otherwise well with a normal birth, natal, postnatal history. only the development has been delayed on head to toe examination there are lots of dysmorphic features when we find features which are not like a normal child they are called dysmorphic features so the child has lots of dysmorphic features and central nervous system examination shows significant hypotonia with hypermobility and laxity of joints and ligaments so with this what is the probable diagnosis in this child so we have developmental delay features of dysmorphism and an advanced age of the mother now these three especially when we have features of classic dysmorphism now the dysmorphism this child has is very specific of a particular syndrome so this syndrome is called the down syndrome in down syndrome whatever dysmorphic features i have highlighted the child looks exactly like that so most children with down syndrome irrespective of their parentage all the down syndrome children essentially look like siblings they all look very very alike that is the hallmark criteria of features of down syndrome so with this what was the etiology of this the etiology for this child developing down syndrome was the fact that his mother's age was advanced 40 years at the age of delivery and the risk of trisomy 21 is very high as there is advanced maternal age so with that let's go to the introduction of down syndrome Now, Down syndrome is the commonest chromosomal anomaly with intellectual disability. It occurs due to the presence of an extra chromosome 21. Hence, it is called trisomy 21. The incidence ranges from one in 733 to one in 1000 among live births. It has classical features, which can be, and so the essential essence of Down syndrome can be intellectual disability, congenital anomalies. and characteristic dysmorphic features all three together synchronize to form down syndrome the etiopathogenesis of down syndrome now out of 100 percentage of children with down syndrome 95% have trisomy of the 21st chromosome which means 
three copies of the 21st chromosome instead of the normal two. Why does this happen? It occurs due to the non-disjunction of the 21st chromosome in the maternal meiosis, causing both the 21st chromosomes to enter into one haploid germ cell, while the other haploid germ cell does not have any 21st chromosome and that germ cell becomes not viable. 4% are due to translocations involving chromosome 13, 14, 15, 21 and 22. These are called Robertsonian translocation, wherein a part of the 21st chromosome is attached to either the 13th, 14th, 15th or 22nd chromosomes and forms a different type of translocated chromosome. Those are the Robertsonian translocations. 1% are mosaic down syndrome. When we say mosaic down syndrome, it implies that the, all the cells are not the same. Like the meaning of the word mosaic is different, it's random. So similarly in mosaic down syndrome, some cells have 47 chromosomes and some cells have 46 chromosomes. So that is what the 1% of down syndrome can be mosaic down syndrome. Now I'll just show you a diagram. What is the meiotic non-disjunction? And what is the translocation in Down syndrome? Now in meiotic non-disjunction, this is a normal maternal cell. Now when it undergoes meiosis, it should form two cells. Each cell should have one copy of the 21st chromosome. Okay, so this is the normal meiosis, which is normal. Now, what happens when there is advanced maternal age? This is what happens when there is advanced maternal age. Both the chromosomes land up going to one haploid germ cell while the other germ cell does not have any 21st chromosome. So this is not viable. And this chromosome, when this haploid germ cell binds to the paternal chromosome with one haploid germ cell, it results in trisomy 21. Because there will be three copies two from the mother and one from the father for the 21st chromosome, that is trisomy 21. So 95% of the Down syndrome come like occur in this manner. Now what happens in translocation Down syndrome? Now 4% of Down syndrome come under translocation. So what happens here is, now here translocation Down syndrome, parents will be translocation carriers. So this is how they will carry. They will have one copy of 14th. 1 copy 21 and 1 copy the 1421 translocation. So when this undergoes meiosis, there are numerous possibilities. You can have 1 14 and 1 21. So 14, 21 normal chromosomes will be one haploid germ cell. 1 can be the 1421 translocation and 14. So 1421 translocated. What I will do, I will just color the 21st one, just to make it evident, okay. okay. So you have one with the 14 and the 1421 and you have the other haploid cell which will be and the 14. So 1421 and this will be with 14. So these are the three types of haploid cells which are formed following the meiosis in a parent who is a translocation 1421 carrier. Now when these bind to a normal cell, what happens is you can have various options. You can have a normal child where the other parent cell is normal. You can have a normal 14 and normal 21. So you can have both normal 14 and normal 21, 14, 14, 21 and 21. Now when you bind the translocations, here the translocated chromosome, the 1421 translocation where one side is 14, one side is 21, it will bind with another 14, another 21. 
So this can have, you will have trisomy, here you will have 21, here you will have 21. So you can have trisomy 21. Along with this, you can also have trisomy 14, you can have monosomy 14. All of these are possible in translocation carriers when the parents are. So in those patients, you can have numerous congenital anomalies when the parents are translocation carriers. So this is translocation of Robertsonian translocation which occurs in 4% of parents of children who have Down syndrome. This is what occurs in 4% of children who have Down syndrome. Now coming to the risk factors in Down syndrome. The biggest risk factor which is very important which is what is required when all of you take cases of Down syndrome in the exam is the advanced maternal age. Now, any maternal age above the age of 35 years this is at the age of conception. So at the age of conception mothers above the age of 35 years the risk factor is very very high. Now Down syndrome can also occur de novo in younger parents when the etiology is mosaicism or translocation. That is why when you have suppose you get in the exam a child who is Down syndrome for your uh, practicals and the parents are young and if you are asked how come the mother's age is only 22 and they have a Down syndrome, the answer is this. When the Down syndrome etiology is either mosaicism or translocation, even young parents can have Down syndrome offspring. It is only the trisomy 21 which is seen in advanced maternal age. Now what is the risk with respect to the age of the mother? At 25 years, a mother has a risk of 1 in 1300 to carry a Down syndrome baby. This reduces to 1 in 365 at the age of 35 years and by age of 40-45 years it becomes as high as 1 in 30. In fact, this is how the graph will look. Now here you can keep 20 years, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45 years and here we can have the risk of Down syndrome baby. Remember the risk is never zero because there is always mosaicism or translocations which can be the cause. So you will never have zero percent risk. In fact you will have a risk like this. This is the risk of carrying a Down syndrome baby with respect to the maternal age. You see up till 35 the risk is actually quite less 1 in 1100 and this is essentially for trisomy 21. Okay, remember it is not for the mosaicism or the translocation, they can occur de novo. Even with normal parents, mosaicism and translocation can occur because they occur in that fertilization and in that germ cell. It does not have to come from the parents. Okay, so that is how the risk of Down syndrome will suddenly rise when the maternal age gets advanced, especially over the age of 35. So if in the exam you get a child, who is Down syndrome and you are asked to justify why. If the maternal age is advanced, most probable etiology is trisomy 21 because of maternal meiotic non-disjunction of the 21st chromosome. Same thing, you have a child who is Down syndrome in the exam and when you are asked the etiology, the mother's age is only 25 years. That time you are going to justify saying that since the mother is only 25 years and the child has all features of Down syndrome, most probably the etiology is either mosaicism or Robertsonian translocation. Okay. So now coming to the clinical features of Down syndrome. First, developmental delay with intellectual disability. This is the first and very, very important clinical feature in Down syndrome. They usually psychomotor retardation. Now coming to the appearance. Appearance has lots of dysmorphic features. This is very very important and is usually asked both in your theory as well as in the practical exam. So what are all the dysmorphic features? And finally we will be discussing the systemic features of Down syndrome. So first let's begin with the head and face dysmorphic features. The child will have mild microcephaly with a flat occiput. If you all remember that one and a half year old child had a head circumference of 38 centimeters. 38 centimeters is the head circumference which is normally seen at one and a half to two and a half months of age. And there we had this clinical case where the one and a half year old child had a head circumference of 38 centimeters. 
So that is microcephaly. So here also in clinical features, you can have mild microcephaly with a flattened occiput. You can have upward slant of the palpable fissures, which is what is known as the mongoloid slant. So you have the mongoloid slant of the eyes. Then you have epicanthal folds. Epicanthal folds are fold seen just above the palpable fissure in the inner canthus of the eye. You will have a flat nasal, nasal bridge with widely spaced eyes which is called hypertelorism. Children have a protruding tongue. These children have a protruding tongue because of macroglossia. They have small dysplastic ears, a short neck and a short sternum. Now these are all the features in the head, neck and face. Now coming to the limbs. In the hands, there is a single transverse palmar crease which is called a simian crease. There is a short fifth digit with clinodactyly. When we say short fifth digit, the little finger of both hands will be shorter distinctly when compared to the other fingers. This is because of an absence or a very rudimentary middle phalanx of the little finger. So you have absence or a rudimentary middle phalanx of the little finger. Fifth digit of the hand. Clinodactyly is inward bending of that little finger towards the uh, medial part of the hand. In the feet, what do you see? You see a wide gap between the first and second toe, which is called the sandal gap. It is called sandal gap because in the ancient period, that is the area where the vertical part of the sandal used to be used, where that used to be the part which is used to hold the sandal. So this looks as though there is a gap kept for that. So that is where it is called the sandal gap. And when we look at the sole of the feet, just beyond the sandal gap, we have a distinct crease which goes downwards into the sole, a vertical crease. That is called the Kennedy's crease. Now I'll show you the pictures. Now look at these children. All these are four different children with Down syndrome. Now here you can see the mongoloid slant of the eyes of this child. Here the eyes are, the eyes are not evenly spaced. You have this kind of mongoloid slant of the eyes. So here you can see mongoloid slant in the eyes. And can you see this fold here? Okay. Now that fold is called the epicanthal fold. This is classical of Down syndrome, the epicanthal folds. Now in the other child here, you can see there is no occiput. The neck is flush with the head. This is the flat occiput and microcephaly, which I had told was a classic feature of Down syndrome. Okay, And you see the ear here in this child. The ears are little bit dysplastic and small. They are not of the normal size like normal ears. And here in this child, you can see these. You can see that gap between the first and second toe. This is the sandal gap. This is the sandal gap. Where you see even here, there is a wide gap between the first toe and the second toe. And here, this is the macroglossia. The children always have a protruding tongue. Tongue is always protruded outside because of the macroglossia. Protruding tongue. Okay, so these are all the primary clinical features what you must see in the facial profile of a child with Down syndrome. They have a flat facial profile. Remember this, flat facial profile. You will also see in this child, you can also see, see, what I have marked is something called the interpupillary distance. The distance between the two pupils of either eyes. Now this should be a constant. In children with hypertelorism, where the eyes are set wide apart, this interpupillary distance will be widened and that is what is called hypertelorism. So here is what you can see, hypertelorism. See this area, flattened nasal bridge and a flat facial profile. So these are all the findings in the face of children with Down syndrome. And whenever you see such features, you have to describe as many features as possible when you are writing an answer or when you are taking a case of Down syndrome. Each of these features is very, very specific and hallmark of 
down syndrome the more features you find and the more features you describe the more credence you will get for having identified down syndrome and here i am showing you a picture of a newborn with down syndrome see the eyes the eyes are looking the child is looking down but if you when the child looks up you'll see that classical mongoloid slant of the eyes you can see this the distance here looks so wide the flattened nasal bridge the wide spaced eyes and see in the hand of this child you can see see this fifth digit it is such a small digit when compared to the other digits and you see normally you can see these two creases no here in the little finger you are not able to see those two creases you can see only one crease so this is what is called the absent middle phalanx of the little digit of the hand and this inward bend you can see the little finger is bent towards the child bent bent towards the hand this is what is the clinodactyly so clinodactyly that is what is seen in this hand you, this child does not have simian crease if the child had to have simian crease you would find that almost both these lines would be together there would be a single crease like this that is the simian crease this child does, didn't have it but it's not essential that all children with down syndrome have all the findings which i have described many children of down syndrome will have almost 80 85% of the findings i have described some finding the children may may not have okay now coming to the systemic features the systemic features let's start with the central nervous system children are developmentally delayed you may also have diseases like autistic spectrum disorder they may have seizure disorder they may have other behavioral disorders there is usually generalized hypotonia in the cardiovascular system findings are seen almost in a large number 40 to 60% of children with down syndrome show cardiovascular features and what are they classical are endocardial cushion defects you can also have atrial septal defect ventricular septal defect or patent ductus arteriosus the hallmark that endocardial cushion defects is a very commonly asked mcq in children with cardiovascular features in down syndrome many case clinical case scenarios will be put to you wherein children with down syndrome are having cardiac complaints and what will be the etiology the etiology is most commonly endocardial cushion defects in the endocrine system children can develop hypothyroidism which is very common as they reach up to pubertal age group and adult age you find features of infertility children can also have features of obesity because of abnormal endocrine system in the gastrointestinal system many fear findings are found in the neonatal period you will have constipation and when we have significant constipation in exclusively breastfed child we should evaluate for hirschsprung's disease you will also have neonatal conjugated hyperbilirubinemia where you can have annular pancreas producing conjugated jaundice conjugated or prolonged neonatal jaundice you can have anorectal malformations where you can have high anorectal malformations or low anorectal malformations with child having absent anus imperfect anus vestibular anus all these problems and all anorectal malformations are common to occur if children start vomiting in the neonatal period the diagnosis which we should consider is duodenal atresia duodenal atresia is a very common feature in down syndrome and it seems quite a significant majority that is 12% of the cases of down syndrome can have duodenal atresia there is also delayed teeth eruption in down syndrome in the musculoskeletal system you can have generalized hypotonia with hyperextensibility of joints because of ligamentous laxity there will be pelvic dysplasia which can be visualized as flared out iliac wings in the pelvic x-rays there can also be instability of the atlantoaxial joint now this instability of the atlantoaxial joint is very important because sudden hyperextension of the atlantoaxial joint when it's already unstable can cause subluxation subluxation will automatically result in cervical cord compression and quadriparesis so this is a very scary situation to be in 
That is why instability of the atlanto axial joint should be very carefully watched for. The parent should be counseled about it. In the hematological system, Down syndrome children have a predisposition to develop leukemias like transient myeloproliferative disorder, acute lymphoblastic leukemia and acute myeloid leukemia. The immune system, you can have transient issues of the immune system wherein the child will have recurrent infections, especially of the respiratory tract. This could be sinusitis, otitis media, pharyngitis, nasopharyngitis, etc. The skin of Down syndrome is usually dry with a lot of seborrhea and flaking dandruff. Ophthalmological features that children with Down syndrome have are squint, strabismus, nystagmus, cataracts, refractive errors, all can be there in ophthalmological features. Audiological complications, they will have conductive hearing loss and this conductive hearing loss can be because of the recurrent infection producing serous otitis media. Finally, what is the life expectancy in Down syndrome? The life expectancy in Down syndrome when there are no comorbidities, when I say I don't mean diabetes, hypertension. Here when I say comorbidities, I mean all the other cardiac, gastrointestinal, other abnormalities which we have read in systemic features now. So in Down syndrome children who have no comorbidities, the life expectancy is 50 to 55 years. Now, there are certain specific criteria in Down syndrome and specific charts. Now, this is important because specific criteria are usually asked as MCQs for the exam, including NEET. And use of specific charts in Down syndrome is required when you are given a case of Down syndrome, especially in your practical exam. Now, coming to the criteria for diagnosis of Down syndrome, it is called the HALS criteria. In the HALS criteria, there are 10 criteria for diagnosis of Down syndrome and where it is in the neonatal period. What are they? Poor morose reflex and hypotonia. A flat facial profile. Upward or mongoloid slant of the palpable features. Simple small round ears. Redundant loose neck skin. There is a lot of pad of fat beneath the nape of the neck. That is redundant loose neck skin. Single palmar crease. Hyper extensible large joints an abnormal pelvic radiograph and hypoplasia of the fifth finger. Now, these 10 findings are criteria to diagnose Down syndrome in the neonate and that is what is called the Hall's criteria. Now, coming to growth plotting. This is another specific plotting called the growth plotting in Down syndrome. Now, growth plotting for Down syndrome has specific charts defined as per age and for the various anthropometric parameters. See, this is how the growth plotting in Down syndrome looks like. Here you have the weight for age. Now this is the weight for age chart in boys who are Down syndrome. And this is the head circumference for age in girls with Down syndrome. Like this, you have weight for age in girls, you have head circumference for age in boys and you have length for age. Length for age charts in Down syndrome males as well as females specific to Down syndrome. So, when you get a Down syndrome case in the exam, do not plot the anthropometry or normal chart. If available, always use the specific Down syndrome charts for plotting of the anthropometry when you get a case of Down syndrome. Now, coming to the investigations in Down syndrome. The investigations in Down syndrome are primarily to diagnose whether it is Downs and then what type of Downs it is. And what is most important? Clinical suspicion is primary. When you look at the classical dysmorphic facial features, that's when you start suspecting Down syndrome. After you suspect Down syndrome, then you have to confirm that Down syndrome. And how do you confirm it? You confirm it by karyotyping. What will the karyotyping show? Karyotyping will show 47 chromosomes with 3 copies of the 21st chromosome. Now here I have shown you the normal karyotype. If you see the normal karyotype, you see these are two copies of each cell. So you have one from the maternal. So one is the maternal, one is the paternal copy of the karyotype. Like this you have numerous, you can see chromosome 1, 2, 3. Like that each chromosome is numbered. And like this you will go down. See here this is chromosome 21, this is chromosome 22. And here you can see the 
sex chromosome. So one is X and one is Y. So this is a boy and this is a normal child. A normal child, boy child karyotype, this is how it will look. So when you ask to interpret normal karyotype, you will see how many are there. So you will see the big ones, 1, 2, 3 and they are arranged in their descending size order. So chromosome 1, 2, 3 will essentially be bigger. Slowly in the second line you will find up to chromosome 12, 13, 14 and all. And the smallest chromosomes will be the chromosome 21, 22. And you will have the sex chromosomes in the end. So this is interpretation of normal karyotype. Now see here, this is the karyotype. What do you see here? You see chromosome 1 is okay, 2 is okay. And as you look everywhere, there are two, two copies exactly looking identical. One from the father, one from the mother. And as you go down, go on and you can see the 21st chromosome. Now what has happened here? Here you can see there are three copies of the 21st chromosome as opposed to two copies here. This is trisomy 21. So this is a karyotype which reads trisomy 21. Here also this is a boy. Okay. So this is how you interpret the karyotype in Down syndrome wherein you will look carefully at all the chromosomes as the report is given. And when you are suspecting Down syndrome, your focus will go towards the 21st chromosome. Now in some children, you may have all the classical features of Down syndrome, but your karyotype will show only two chromosomes of you will show only two chromosomes in 21. This is how the 21 will look. That time the report will come like normal. And the parents will ask you that you said this was Down syndrome. And I have read on internet that Down syndrome is trisomy 21. Then how come my child's chromosome analysis has come normal? That is where you have to do a detailed analysis. And you will be able to identify translocations and mosaicism. So mosaicism and translocations will be identified when you do a detailed analysis and this primary report shows normal when the child has all the features of Down syndrome. Now what about the other investigations? Now the other investigations you will do after diagnosing Down syndrome when you know that there are so many comorbidities that Down syndrome can have. In those children you will do other investigations. What are they? You will do an echo to rule out cardiac anomalies. So whenever you see a child is having Down syndrome, you will get the echo done to see whether there are any underlying cardiac anomalies. You will do an erect x-ray abdomen, especially when the child has come with neonatal vomiting and the child is having persistent vomiting unable to feed the child. There you will do an erect x-ray abdomen to identify duodenal atresia. You will do an ultrasound abdomen to identify renal anomalies as well as to confirm duodenal atresia. Thyroid function test to be done because there is an association of Down syndrome with hypothyroidism. Gynecological evaluation has to be done during puberty because of association with infertility, irregular cycles, delayed menarche, all this can be there. So gynecological evaluation has to be done. Now here I will show you an x-ray and what do you see in this x-ray? This is an erect x-ray abdomen. Here the child even the chest has been taken and shown. What do you see in this x-ray? You see, you can see in the abdomen. Now this is the abdomen of the child. What do you see in the abdomen? You see two bubbles. Here one bubble and here one more bubble. So this is called the double bubble appearance. Double bubble appearance. Double bubble appearance. And why do you get it? Double bubble appearance is characteristic of duodenal atresia. Why? Because the stomach bubble is the first bubble. Now the first bubble is the bubble of the stomach. And the second bubble is the bubble of the proximal part of the first part of the duodenum. And it's the second and third part is where you have the atretic segments. So those segments are atretic. So the child's swallowed air will reach up to the stomach and from stomach it will reach up to the first part of duodenum. But because of atresia, it can go no further. You can see the entire abdomen here. This entire abdomen is gasless abdomen. 
So that is all this is characteristic of duodenal atresia. Now I also want you to see count the number of ribs in this child. See, I'll help you count. And when I count, I'm counting the posterior aspects. It's only when you want to see lung inflation will you count the anterior aspects. So let's count to the posterior aspects of the ribs. This is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 and 11. So you have 11 pairs of ribs in this x-ray. This is also another finding in the x-ray of down syndrome where the children show only 11 pairs of ribs. So whenever you have this double bubble appearance, always look for other markers to suggest that this is down syndrome. So for x-ray of the erect extra abdomen in a neonatal vomiting child, if you see a double bubble appearance, the etiology is duodenal atresia, the cause of the etiology is down syndrome. And after when you confirm that, you are going to also look at the number of ribs the child has. If you find 11 pairs of ribs, it is more characteristic of Down syndrome. Simultaneously, you can also look at the chest. You may have endocardial cushion defects where you may show cardiomegaly in the child. This child does not have that, but you can have features where you have cardiomegaly and because of the endocardial cushion defects. Now, what are the other investigations to be done in Down syndrome? They are then based upon the complication that is noticed. That is, when you see a child with Down syndrome, you will confirm with karyotyping. Second, what you will do once you have found that it is Down syndrome, you will search for other co-anomalies which need to be treated well up in the neonatal period to prevent complications occurring in this child. Like I described earlier, the cardiac anomalies to be seen, hypothyroidism to be seen, all this needs to be seen. Now, these are investigations which are done when a complication arises. Like, you will do MRI cervical spine. And when will you do it? You will do it when you are suspecting atlantoaxial subluxation. Now, the atlantoaxial subluxation implies the subluxation of the joint between the first and second cervical vertebra. Now, normally itself in Down syndrome, because of a lot of laxity in the ligaments of the child all through the body, even the atlanto-occipital joint is very lax. Sudden cervical movements, like sudden hyperextension, sudden flexion, which can occur because the children is essentially hypotonic, that time this unstable atlanto-axial joint can subluxate. And when it subluxates, it presses upon the cervical cord. So that time the child may come with quadriparesis and severe neck pain. So that time you will have to do a MRI cervical spine. When you suspect hematological malignancies which are common in Down syndrome, you will have to do a peripheral smear as well as a bone marrow assessment in case you are suspecting development of hematological malignancies. Yearly, you have to follow up the child ophthalmologically as well as do an audiological follow-up. Now coming to a very important section that is the antenatal diagnosis of Down syndrome. Now when the parents have an option for antenatal diagnosis, Always antenatal diagnosis should be done because of the morbidity that Down syndrome becomes to the family of that child. At the 12th week, that is as early as 2 months and 3 weeks, you will have increased nuchal fold thickness. This is all in the fetus. In the fetus, you will have increased thickness of the nuchal fold. Nuchal fold is the fold in the neck of the fetus. Early up in the second trimester, Blood test is done called a quadruple screen. Earlier it used to be called a triple test. But however the quadruple test or the quad screen or the quadruple screen. All of these are found to be more sensitive than the triple test. Hence our obstetrician gynecologist colleagues follow the quadruple screening. This is up early in the second trimester. What does it contain? It contains for doing the free beta HCG, unconjugated estriol, inhibin and alpha fetoprotein in the maternal blood. And this is very sensitive because if this is elevated, you can diagnose up to 80% of Down syndrome fetuses. Once you do a quadruple screen and this quadruple screen comes positive, then it is always better to do an amniocentesis and karyotyping, especially when the risk of Down syndrome is high. Nowadays, many places do detection of the cell-free DNA in the maternal blood. You do have fetal DNA in the maternal blood. 
So detection of this fetal DNA in the maternal blood is a very minimally invasive technique and it has almost 98% accuracy in diagnosis of Down syndrome in that uh, baby. So that is why nowadays we are using detection of cell-free fetal DNA in the maternal blood. Now coming to the complications in Down syndrome. First is the worrisome complication of leukemias. Down syndrome children have got a high risk of developing leukemias. It could be simple transient myelo proliferative disease in infancy. It could be acute lymphoid or acute myeloid leukemia. But however, children with Down syndrome who develop acute myeloid leukemia have got a much better prognosis than developing acute myeloid leukemia in a normal child. Now, atlantoaxial subluxation. 15% of the Down syndrome children have this malaligned C1, C2 vertebra. And this is when these such children have increased hyperflexion or hyperextension of the cervical spine. There is risk of spinal injury because of compression of the cervical cord when this occurs. This C1, C2 vertebra, the minute the child hyperextends or hyperflex the spine, the joint subluxates and when it subluxates, it presses upon the cervical cord and presents with features of quadriparesis. So, this presents with quadriparesis. Obstructive sleep apnea. Now, I had shown you that children have macroglossia or protruding tongue. So, when they have macroglossia and protruding tongue, when they sleep, the tongue will fall back. That will produce obstructive sleep apnea. Children with Down syndrome can have early Alzheimer's disease and develop advanced aging and dementia as early as in the fourth decade. They also have lots of psychiatric issues which is what we see very commonly. There is aggression, there are a lot of behavioral disorders. Almost 20 to 40 percent of Down syndrome children have lots of behavioral disorders. Now the management of Down syndrome. Important thing in the management of Down syndrome is that it is a multidisciplinary therapy. It involves physiotherapy, ophthalmology, speech and audiology, pediatric surgery and behavioral therapy. First, the neurodevelopmental therapy. Here the child is engaged in play and as the child plays with lots of toys and lots of gadgets, the child is able to have strengthening of various muscles and this hypotonia becomes better and the child is able to achieve various milestones. Ophthalmology treatment of the squint at the refractive errors has to be done and this has to be done before neurodevelopmental therapy because a child who cannot see will not gain milestones. Speech and language pathology assessment as well as audiological treatment. When you have this conductive hearing loss, children may require hearing aids, may require ENT examination and drainage of serous otitis media, grome insertion, all that may be required. So that has to be treated. Then audiological evaluation has to be done and after that speech and language have to assess and then we have to start language therapy for language delay. Management of Down syndrome also includes behavioral therapy to address the autistic features, behavioral disorders, developmental issues along with vocational therapy. Treatment of recurring infections is very important. Pediatric surgical management you will require if you have neonatal issues neonatal vomiting and duodenal atresia, if you have annular pancreas and neonatal jaundice, if you are having Hirschsprung's disease and neonatal constipation. Cardiac management is very important because 40 to 60 children present with cardiac issues. So whether this can be managed medically or whether we will require surgical intervention and management of the cardiac condition is very important. Thyroxine supplementation, what I have seen is regularly required in many children with Down syndrome. If not in childhood, during puberty, many children will require thyroid supplementation. Special schooling is important because children with Down syndrome have psychomotor retardation. That is, they have intellectual disability. So, because of their intellectual disability, they are unable to perform like normal children in class. Hence, they will require special schooling and they are very good in performing arts and music. So, special schooling with training in arts and music will bring out the best in these very happy children actually Down syndrome. Genetic counseling. 
genetic counseling is very important in down syndrome because when parents already have one down syndrome child it becomes a great burden to the family if the child if the family has another child with afflicted with the same syndrome hence we have to see the risk of transmission or the risk of recurrence of down syndrome in the future pregnancies and counsel the parents accordingly this is done after karyotyping and chromosomal identification of the genetic defect in the child as well as in their parents even parental karyotype needs to be done how is the risk if both parents are normal and this was a de novo mutation which happened then there's only 1 to 2% risk that the next pregnancy will also have such a de novo mutation if the parents are translocation carriers which i showed you in the diagram that is a haploid translocation carrier if both the parents are translocation carriers there is a 100% risk of the next pregnancy to having down syndrome now this is a very commonly asked mcq and very commonly asked question in the exam what is the chance of the next pregnancy being affected with down syndrome the answer is if parents are normal there is hardly any risk if parents are translocation carriers there is 100% risk of the next pregnancy also being afflicted with down syndrome if the parents have robertsonian translocations like t1421 there is a 5 to 15% risk now 5 to 15% we say what does it mean it means 5% if it's transmitted by the father and 15% if it is transmitted by the mother that is the robertsonian translocation which comes from whichever parent in mosaics that is children who are mosaic down syndrome there is only 1 to 2% risk but this is what is seen when the parents are younger so this is the risk of the next pregnancy being afflicted with down syndrome that is the importance of genetic counseling in down syndrome now with that we'll come to the end of today's class and we come to my summary and take home message we learned that down syndrome is also called trisomy 21 in the etiology 95% of this trisomy 21 is because of non disjunction of the 21st chromosome in 5% we do not have trisomy 21 we in fact have only 46 chromosome 4% of these children will have translocation between the 21st chromosome and either the 13th 14th 15th or 22nd and 1% children have mosaicism we learned about the classical clinical features of down syndrome along with the diagnostic criteria in the neonate called hols criteria we learned that the investigations have to be done in down syndrome for diagnosis of down syndrome that is karyotyping of the child along with the karyotyping of the parents karyotyping of the child to confirm downs karyotyping of the parent for genetic counseling other investigations like echo thyroid function tests etc need to be done for other anomalies the management is essentially a multidisciplinary approach which involves neurodevelopmental therapists ophthalmologists speech and language pathologists and many other allied departments the risk of transmission in the next pregnancy needs careful genetic counseling that is where the parental karyotype plays a major role now coming to my test time A 45-year-old mother brings her 3-year-old child with mongoloid slant of eyes, hypertelorism, microcephaly and simian crease. The child has developmental delay and recent onset of constipation along with weight gain. The most probable diagnosis in this child is A Edwards syndrome with hypoparathyroidism, B Down syndrome with hypothyroidism, C Down syndrome with hyperthyroidism. d patau syndrome with intestinal obstruction now when you have mongoloid slant of eyes hypertelorism microcephaly and simian crease which syndrome is this most likely fitting into it is fitting into down syndrome so automatically option a and option d are out of the list now this is down syndrome and what has happened to the down syndrome child he has developed recent onset of constipation and weight gain and does that fit into hyperthyroidism no in hyperthyroidism you will have diarrhea and weight loss so this is also not the right answer so recent onset of constipation cold intolerance and weight gain is characteristic of hypothyroidism hence the correct answer is b down syndrome with hypothyroidism coming to the second question 
95% of Down syndrome show this in their karyotype. A. Translocation 21-21 B. Mosaicism C. They show a normal karyotype or D. They show triple chromosome 21 or trisomy 21. Now we all know that 95% of Down syndrome will show trisomy 21. It is only the translocations is seen in 4% and mosaicism is seen in 1%. So the correct answer is trisomy 21. The third question. A 4 month old infant with features of Down syndrome comes with excessive forehead sweating and poor weight gain. The child exhibits the typical suck rest, suck cycle while feeding and has episodes of breathlessness. What is the most probable cause for this? A. Is it tetralogy of fallow? B. Is it a cyst adenomatoid malformation in the lung? C. Is it an endocardial cushion defect? Or D. Is it because of sepsis with recurrent pneumonias? Now in this child, we are having excessive forehead sweating. We are having poor weight gain and suck rest suck cycle. Now these all are classical evidence of cardiac anomaly. Cardiac anomaly, hence we are not going to consider lung issues in this child. So among the options B and C get ruled out. You have either tetralogy of fallow or endocardial cushion defects. Now this child has no cyanosis. Now when there is no cyanosis, automatically tetralogy of fallow gets ruled out because tetralogy of fallow is a cyanotic congenital heart disease. So the correct answer is endocardial cushion defect plus we also know that 40 to 60 percent of children with Down syndrome have cardiac anomalies and the most common cardiac anomaly in Down syndrome is endocardial cushion defect. Coming to the fourth question, a newborn is born with mongoloid slant, hypertelorism, semen crease, hypotonia and comes to the NICU with recurrent vomiting. The x-ray of the child shows double bubble appearance. What is the most probable diagnosis? A. Duodenal atresia. B. Sepsis, C. Paralytic ileus or D. Extrahepatic deliriatresia. So when you have a child with Down syndrome presenting with recurrent vomiting and the x-ray showing double bubble appearance, the correct answer becomes duodenal atresia. So the answer is A. Duodenal atresia. The last question, all the following features have been seen in a child with Down syndrome except A. Simian crease, B. Sandal sign, C. Dance sign or D. Kennedy's crease. Now we know the single transverse palmar crease is called the Simian crease. It is seen in Down syndrome. We know the sandal sign or the sandal gap is seen as the increased gap between the first and second toe. So that is also seen in Down syndrome. We know the Kennedy's crease is the crease on the sole of the foot. It is a deep vertical crease that is also seen in Down syndrome. So the correct answer is that the sign which is not seen is called the dance sign. And that is what is not seen in Down syndrome. To go further, where is this dance sign seen? Dance sign is seen in intussusception. It is called sign D dance. This is an empty right iliac fossa sign. So, empty right eye like fossa sign this is a, with a sausage shaped mass present much above. This is called the sign D dance or the dance sign seen in intussusception. And definitely this is not seen in Down syndrome. That is why all are seen except means dance is the only sign which is not seen in Down syndrome. So, with that I have come to the end of today's session. I hope you all learnt about this very important topic of Down syndrome which is important in theory, practicals as well as in your viva. Thank you.